So this morning we're going to be closing out the book of Colossians, and what I'd like to start out by doing is actually reading the passage, and then we'll dig into it. So the passage for this morning is Colossians 4, verses 2 through 18. If you've got your Bibles with you, you can turn to that, and we're going to be touching on it as we go. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Let's pray. Living God, we welcome you here amongst us this morning in your house where you have invited us to worship you. We trust, Lord, that you inspired Paul to write down these words, not just for the sake of the Colossian church, but for ours as well. And we ask you now, Lord, that you would speak to us this morning, that you would be ever-present with us, that we would encounter you. And above all, Lord, may this be an act of worship that brings honor and glory to your name. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I thought, at first that maybe, since this is my last week here at Hope, that instead of preaching, I would simply rewrite Paul's greetings so th as if they were my final greetings to the staff here at Hope Church. So, this is what I came up with. I am leaving you, oh, I should say this, to the believers at Hope Church. I am leaving you with Eric, my brother and fellow worker in the Lord who has the musical heart of David and loves the smell of cinnamon buns. Feed him kindly. I commend to you Russell, a suitable leader and friend who has a particular dislike for flies and anything touchy-feely. <laughs> Ensure that he is well taken care of and amply supplied with Starbucks cards. Kim is a faithful and dear sister who loves the children very much and talks so very fast. Please welcome her for me, but very quickly. Please tell Jay that his office looks like a pigsty. And that the believers out on the farm say hello. And finally, remember my shoes. That is all. And etc. You know, that sort of thing. But then it struck me that, you know, Paul's words are sort of inspired, and mine, frankly, aren't. So we're just going to keep the focus on him this morning. These final instructions and final greetings are how Paul often signs off his letters. And although there's a lot of details and mention of people that we don't know, a context that we aren't aware of, this is an opportunity in these final greetings for us to see the humanness of these letters. These words didn't just fall from the sky. They were originally written for a, a specific church in a specific, a specific time and context with specific people involved. You see the networking that happens between these churches. 
the partnership, the brotherly love between the leaders. Tychicus is a dear brother. Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother. I feel so bad for the guy that ended up with the same name as Jesus. Probably had to spend his whole life clarifying that. No, I'm not him. (laughs) When we read these final greetings, we're reminded of the journey of Christianity, the connectedness, the commitment between the people, the encouragement that it took, the support. These sorts of letters can only happen every so often when the circumstances actually allowed for it, when Paul actually had paper in prison and a scribe to write it for him, when there was actually somebody traveling to and from the area. So he's not just writing whatever comes to mind here. He's being very intentional. This letter is going to be read out loud to multiple congregations. So he's being, he's being intentional to acknowledge and encourage certain people and give specific instructions in case he may not be able to do so again. So this letter isn't just a bunch of big theological statements about Christ and the church. It's actually really quite personal. And all of that, all of those greetings could actually be a sermon in themselves. And I'm going to touch on a few of them this morning, but the focus for the sermon this morning will lie on the earlier verses in 2 through 6. Because in these five verses, we probably get Paul's most practical teaching in this whole letter. He's just gone into this whole cosmic theological language about who Christ is, implications for the church. But here, in these five verses, is where he really lands the plane. So these aren't just extra instructions tagged on at the end like, oh yeah, I almost forgot, make sure you do this too. This is the, if nothing else, this needs to happen kind of paragraph. This is the, if you've got nothing else from what I've just said, if it's gone right over your head, if you've been sleeping this entire time, if there is only one thing that you're going to get from this whole letter, this is what he wants us to get. Because right smack dab in the middle of it, in verse 3, is the big so what. What's this all for? What's this whole thing about? What have I been telling you this whole time? Why have I been saying to set your minds on things above? to put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, to bring down and trample on all human divisions. Why? So that you may proclaim the mystery of Christ. Well, what is this mystery again? Well, Paul tells us back in chapter 1, verse 27, to them, the saints... God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is Christ himself, and the riches of this mystery, the benefit, the outflow, the gain for all those Gentiles who have been now welcomed in, is Christ himself in you. And what Paul is now saying to the Colossian church is essentially that because you have been made aware of this mystery, you need to now live out this mystery so that you can proclaim this mystery. Paul shows them here in verses 2 through 6 how to do that. And he says a bunch of things, but I'm just I'm going to touch on six. Six steps towards proclaiming this mystery. But I'm going to group them into two sets of three. Because in the first half, Paul focuses us in through conversation with God, through prayer. And then in the second half, he focuses us out through conversation with the other. But all six of these do have one thing in common. They put the emphasis on him rather than on us. The focus is on him. Because in order to proclaim him... The focus must always be on him. Remember, the Colossian church was attempting to achieve spiritual maturity through worldly wisdom, deceptive philosophy, rituals, higher spiritual experiences. Essentially, they were emphasizing that spiritual maturity was all about what you can do to achieve it. The focus was on what you can do and what you can achieve in order to be spiritually mature. Paul here, however, flips that around completely. These are instructions, these are things for us to do, but they are instructions 
that reorient our minds to put the focus on him rather than on us. So, the first set, focusing in through prayer. Verses 2 and 3. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Three steps here. Be devoted, be watchful, and be aware of the cost. First, be devoted. A good question to frequently ask yourself is, what am I devoted to? What is the main topic of my conversations? What do I think about the most? Is it my spouse, my kids, my job, my ever-growing list of things to do? What am I devoted to? Paul says here, be devoted to prayer. Why? Because, for one, it implies that we are devoted to communicating with him. We are devoted to being in conversation with him, and thereby we are devoted to him. And second, if we're not praying, we're under the assumption that we don't need him, that we can do it without him. And that isn't to say that the Holy Spirit isn't still working even when we don't ask him to. But the weight in our own minds will always remain on us unless we shift it to him. The perspective needs to shift from us to him. And that happens through prayer. You can tell when people have spent a lot of time in prayer. They've put the emphasis off of themselves and onto the Holy Spirit. There is a huge weight taken off of your shoulders when you know that this isn't about you, that it's not about your performance, but rather allowing him to perform through you. Christ in you. You carry him with you. Prayer enables us, reminds us, that we embody him. Or don't you know? Do you not know that your body is a temple for the living God? There's this great scene in The Lion King, and this is one of those things as a preacher you should never do. Never chew on stage, never chew gum on stage, and never quote from one of the really popular movies. But everybody does it. But there's this great scene in The Lion King where Rafiki is taking Simba on this wild goose chase to show him his father. And they're running through jungles, over and under branches, through thorns and whatnot, and they come to a screeching halt at the edge of this stream. And Rafiki nudges Simba to go and to look into this stream. Simba, you know, creeps up to the edge. Now, his father has passed away years before, so he thinks that this baboon is crazy. But he, he creeps up to the edge of this rock, and he looks into the water, and he sees his own reflection. Nah, that's not my father, he says. That's just my own reflection. But then Rafiki says to him, no, 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 no. Look harder. So he does, and as he keeps looking, the image, the reflection, gradually shifts to being the image of his father. And Rafiki says to him, see, he lives in you. You guys are never going to watch that movie the same way again. <laughs> he lives in you. The living God, the spirit of the living God indwells you. Wherever you are, whatever mood you're in, you may have not even had your morning coffee yet. You indwell. He indwells within you. This should inspire confidence within us. Whenever you walk in those doors, you bring him in with you. When you sit down in the pew beside somebody else, they're, they're also, they also have the living God indwelling them. The living God dwells in you. One of my profs once said it this way, you can't get any closer than in. He can't possibly be any closer to us. If we keep thinking that God is out there rather than in here, 
our prayers are going to continue to be like torpedoes to heaven. Messages in the bottle that we send off out to sea. A helium balloon that we accidentally let go and just shoots off into oblivion. If, however, we acknowledge that he is within us, a constant companion walking along with us, right beside us in every situation, in every interaction, then it becomes much more instinctive to acknowledge him, to sense him there with us, to say in those moments, Lord, I need you. Lord, help me. Lord, what would you have me say? And if those prayers aren't instinctive, we can pray that they would become instinctive. The Holy Spirit loves and delights to help us to pray. There is no other relationship like that. Only God would say, hey, you know, I know you don't really like talking to me, but I want to help you with that. Who does that? Only God desires and delights to teach us how to be in communication with him, how to slow down and acknowledge him. Because when we are devoted to prayer, we are devoted to him. And the focus remains on him. Second step. Paul says to be watchful and thankful. Well, hold on, okay. Thankful I get. Watchful. Watchful for what? Well, in ancient times, if you were stationed on a watchtower, you were the one who was waiting and watching for when the king and his armies would return from battle. You were waiting and watching for him to show up. The prophet Habakkuk says this in Habakkuk 2 verse 1, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me. Using that same imagery, Paul then tells the Colossian church to pray with expectation. Be watchful for what he may say to you. So often, we think that prayer needs to be us just talking at God. Oh, yes, I thanked you. I think you're so good. I praised you. I've told you that I need this and this. And, you know, Aunt Susie needs help too. And blah, 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 blah. Thank you for my daily bread. Awesome. Good talking to you. Would you do that at a coffee date? You go out for coffee with somebody and you just talk at them the whole time and then leave and think, oh yeah, that was a great coffee date. They'll never go out with you again. Have we given him a chance to say anything? If anything, we need him to speak to us, not only to affirm us, but to grant us direction. He's our leader. Lord, what would you have me say? What would you have me do? You see that all over scripture. In prayer, we approach him through the Holy Spirit, listening for him and expecting that he will speak to us. Mother Teresa once said, prayer is not asking. Prayer is putting oneself into the hands of God at his disposition and listening to his voice in the depths of our hearts. We are so uncomfortable in our culture with silence. After maybe eight to 10 seconds of standing in a group, or, or if you're praying with a group, after eight to 10 seconds of silence, people start getting really uncomfortable. Start shifting around, moving the pillows, letting out a big sigh, anything to fill the space, right? It's awkward. Well, if we were to reorient ourselves to see silence as listening, well, then suddenly it, it becomes active rather than passive. Silence becomes an opportunity, a gift, a chance to listen for the God who is always speaking to us. Be watchful. Paul also says here to be thankful. And I, and I just want to briefly say that praying with an attitude of gratitude, even when you don't feel like it, will lift your spirits like nothing else. Because what that does, being thankful in prayer, also takes the emphasis off of ourselves and puts it on the God from whom all blessings flow. Thirdly, Paul reminds the Colossian church that this proclamation has put him in chains. Verse 3, And pray for us too, 
that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Here's where we have that pinnacle phrase, proclaim the mystery of Christ, but it is linked to a cost. It is linked to Paul's state in prison. He reminds them again at the end of the letter, remember my chains. Remember that affliction is often a natural outcome of proclaiming freedom in Christ. Others may want to put you in bondage. Others may want to hold you captive by deceptive philosophies or make you doubt or feel foolish. That's why we need to be upholding one another in prayer. Even Paul needed the church to be praying for him, probably because he needed reminding. Am I depending on him regardless of my circumstances? Paul mentions Epaphras in verse 12, who is always wrestling in prayer for you so that you can stand firm, mature, and fully assured. Remember my chains. Remember that countless people have suffered and are still suffering for the sake of this message because this message of freedom is not the same message of freedom that the world gives. I think Christians in developing countries often get this better than we do. It's not the same message. The Greek word for witness is actually martyria, which is where we get the word martyr from. And that's not to say that to be a witness, you need to go through physical martyrdom, not at all. But it definitely means an attitude shift of putting oneself and others through prayer completely into the hands of God and taking the risk that embodying Jesus and pointing to him may bring about affliction. It's why we need the support of prayer, because it means having to trust Jesus all the way, even if people don't like us or are offended. Again, put the emphasis on him. Because suffering with Christ only makes sense if you know the end of the story. If you know who wins at the end of the story. If you know that Christ has the final victory, that he has already won it, then all of your suffering gets put into that larger context. So, at the end of the day, if we want Christ to be proclaimed, we need first to get on our knees. We won't be able to proclaim him otherwise. One of the biggest detriments to the gospel's message is when the church ceases to be a house of prayer. One, uh, one non-churchgoer once asked me, well, you know, if the church believes so much in prayer, why don't you guys pay people to pray? I thought, that's a good question. I don't know. We, but we shouldn't have to pay people to pray. This is our very identity to be communicating with him. This is who we are. To be servants who walk on our knees. The practical always begins with the prayerful. We will not proclaim if we have not prayed. Because we simply cannot do it on our own. So, then, after turning the focus inwards, through prayer, communication with God, Paul then turns the people's focus outwards to conversations with the other. Verses 5 through 6. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So, now that you have put the emphasis on him through your own life in prayer, what does this now look like in your interactions with others? It looks like this. Be wise, be full of grace, and be a salt shaker. Sorry, that was the only way that I could keep the pattern going. Be wise. What does this look like? Well, remember that Paul has told us that this mystery has been made known to the Gentiles. In this community, in the church community, there is no human division. There is no Jew or Gentile, slave or free. The walls of human division have come down. We are one body. We are all one. 
The Onesimus that he mentions in verse 9 may very well be that same Onesimus that is talked about in the book of Philemon, the slave, who here is a dear brother, somebody who is one with us, along with everyone else, perhaps even a leader in the church. Paul also addresses Jews and Gentiles together in these greetings, meaning that these two groups are now fellowshipping with one another. So you cannot then look at an outsider as any different from you. Be wise with this wisdom that is grounded in Christ. Being wise means seeing everyone as equal before God. And Paul writes this in chapter 1, verse 9. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. This wisdom is given to us by the Spirit. So whenever you speak out of a place of wisdom, you are speaking out of a place of the Spirit who dwells within you. And it is the Spirit who also enables you to do what Paul says next. Let, those, let your conversations be always full of grace. That is how you make the most of your conversations with outsiders. Paul doesn't say that you need to change their hearts. You can't do that. He just says, let your conversation be full of grace. That's when you are able to converse with people in freedom, when you can really point them to Jesus. Not when you're using the latest tactic in evangelism or the latest research in apologetics, but when you're filling your conversation with grace, something that the world does not understand. Philip Yancey writes in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, that the world runs predominantly on ungrace. It's all about working for favor, earning our privileges, achieving success. The focus is on our merits and on our efforts. Going through a burnout showed me the error in this. After I had worked and served and worked and served and exerted all the energy that I had to prove myself, and then had to suffer the consequences and for a couple months do absolutely nothing and feel absolutely worthless, it suddenly dawned on me that I don't understand grace. I actually could not fathom it. It didn't make any sense to me. Why is that? Because understanding grace means understanding that there is nothing we can do to win God's favor for us because it has already been won for us. The whole point of grace is that it is a gift to those who don't deserve it. When we realize this about ourselves, that we did nothing to earn or receive this gift, it's only then that we can be in a posture to offer it or extend it to others. Because who am I to judge whether someone else is worthy or not of receiving grace? Grace has absolutely nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with him. Fill your conversations with grace. And then finally, Paul says, let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt going on here? All right, well, salt, it's a wonderful little substance that brings richness and flavor to the food that you sprinkle it on. There, there's a really good metaphor there. could go that way. But I think that what Paul is really doing here, actually, is reflecting on a passage found in the Old Testament that comes out of Leviticus 2, verse 13, where the Israelites are told to do this. Season all your grain offerings with salt, do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out of your grain offerings. What are the Israelites being told to do there? Not to make sure that their food tastes nice and salty, but to remember the covenant that they have with their God. It had nothing to do with the offering. It had everything to do with remembering their first love, remembering who they were devoted to. Do not leave the flavor of the covenant that you have with your God out of your offerings, which in the case of the Colossian church would be their conversations. 
Your covenant relationship with God is what saltifies the rest of your conversations, brings richness to it. If you're distant from God, you can't very well converse with others about him. Your devotion for him will naturally flavor your conversations. The evidence of your relationship with him will become evident in your relationships and conversations with others. And Paul here says to season your conversations with this salt so that you can know how to answer everyone. The order here is important. He doesn't say to make sure you know all the answers so that you can show people grace and salt. Grace and salt are a prerequisite here. He says, fill your conversations with the gift of grace and cover it with covenant salt so that you can know how to answer everyone. If you understand grace and you understand this covenant relationship that you have with God, then you are in a posture to speak with others. All of this is built on you knowing who he is. Again, all of this is about keeping the emphasis on God and taking the pressure off of ourselves. Because in our interactions with others, the triune God, the, Holy, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit aren't standing there like three judges in the Olympics with their one through ten scorecards and saying, you know, Bill, that was about a 3.4. Could have done a little better. Maybe given them a CD or something. He's with us in those moments, within us. You're never separate from him. He's not standing away from you watching. He's right there with you. He's delighting in you from within you. You don't need to seek the extra or the higher spiritual experiences because he's already as close as he can be. That is the glorious mystery that has been revealed. The center of our devotion, the gift of grace, the source of salt for our conversations. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Is this what outsiders see when they look at the church? Is this the draw for people to the church, Christ in us? Because oftentimes I think the church tends to function more like a marketplace. The, the clergy or the staff or the sales representatives, the doctrines or the, the things that we're selling, the ministries and the outreach become like the techniques, the marketing techniques. This is how we win people to Christ. But is that what we're trying to do? Win people to Christ? Market the church? Or are we trying to demonstrate Christ within us? Dwight L. Moody once said that out of 100 people, one will read the Bible and 99 will read the Christian. I think that's true. It is the church's task to proclaim this mystery. All of our efforts should be done with that end goal in mind, with that motivation. This is why everything you do should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus. With every single word and action, we need to be pointing to him. This is what Paul has been laboring for this whole time, why he's writing this letter, why he's in chains in the first place. And in his final instructions here, he hammers home this point that this is what it's all for. He has spent the whole letter fighting against heresies, setting Christ and the wisdom to be found in him above everything else, putting Christ as head, ruler, Lord, master over everything, supreme over all, stating that everything you do should be done in his name. Why? Because we love cell phones. Why? Why? He's calling us. See, he's calling us, guys. I knew this. Why? Because the church is his body. We are his body. He lives in us, and we are meant to proclaim him. We are here to proclaim this incredible mystery, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Brennan Manning once said this, and I want to end off here with this quote. The gospel is absurd, and the life of Jesus is meaningless 
unless we believe that he lived, died, and rose again with but one purpose in mind, to make brand new creation. Not to make people with better morals, but to create a community of prophets and professional lovers, men and women who would surrender to the mystery of the fire of the Spirit that burns within, who would live in ever greater fidelity to the omnipresent Word of God, who would enter into the center of it all, the very heart and mystery of Christ, into the center of the flame that consumes, purifies, and sets everything aglow with peace, joy, boldness, and extravagant, furious love. This, my friend, is what it really means to be a Christian. Let's pray. Living God, we, we thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that you would remind us of how close you are to us, that you would enable us, Lord, that you would teach us how to keep you as our focus, how to keep you as our first love, as our devotion. Go with us, Lord, in our interactions. May we be ever attentive to you and to your spirit's power within us so that we may proclaim you to everyone with whom we encounter, to everyone that we speak to. May above all, Lord, you be glorified in everything we say or do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So one of, perhaps, the most profound ways that we can proclaim this mystery is by coming around the Lord's table in fellowship. And historically, there have been three names that have been attributed to this act of worship. The Lord's Supper, Communion, and the Eucharist. And all three of them are actually very helpful for explaining why we do this in the first place. Why, why, do, we, why do we bother with this? Because there are actually three things that this table does for us. Three, three directions that it points us. First, it points us behind to the Lord's Supper. To when the Lord himself sat around a table with his disciples and took a piece of bread and said, this is my body, which will be given for you. When we come to the table, we remember his sacrifice for us. Secondly, it points us to the church today, to our communion with one another. Because just as many grains make up one bread, we who are many members make up one body. As we come to the table, we remember each other. We remember our other members. And as he sacrificed for us, we now sacrifice for one another. And then lastly, it points us to head. It points us to the day when the whole universal body of Christ will gather around the heavenly table, people from every tribe and tongue, to give praise and glory to he who sits on the throne. When we come to the table today, we remember his sacrifice, we remember that we sacrifice for one another, and we remember that one day we will experience the fullness of his reign in glory. I want to now invite the band up and, and Arv as well. Now at the first service this morning, Pastor Russell made somewhat of a surprise entrance at this point in time. So first of all, I want to just let you know he came through his uh, surgery successfully uh, this week and, and continues to uh, recuperate and continue uh, to ask for your prayers for him as, as he recovers and, and regains his strength. But the reason that he came up was uh, because this is the last Sunday that uh, Jenna, who's been serving as our summer intern, that Jenna will be uh, with us. And uh, he wanted to take that opportunity, since she's been primarily uh, interning with him, uh, to, to thank her. And, and we want to do that as well uh, in this uh, service. Hopefully many of you have had some uh, way to have contact with Jenna, uh, obviously, in, as she has led our services or through Bible school um, through the class that she taught, maybe even on the softball field. Did you play softball? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to see me there. <laughs> so uh, we're thankful that uh, Jenna 
uh, has been with us and, and blessed us. And do you uh, want to share just a little bit what your uh, plans are now? Sure. Um, it, yeah, it's really actually quite simple. I've got one more year at seminary, so I'll be going back to Vancouver and spending a year there. And then if God, are, will, if God continues to lead in the direction of ordination, then I would also be spending a semester after that at Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So, so would you join me in thanks, uh, show of appreciation for Jenna for being with us? <laughs> While, while you are standing, we will send, uh, send Jenna off with a word of prayer. And, and if you uh, feel comfortable and would like to just extend your hand towards her, um, you can, can do that. And we will finish in prayer uh, this morning. Oh, Lord, we thank you that Jenna has uh, been gifted by you with, in so many ways. And that we have had the blessing of having her be with us this uh, summer. And, and that she uh, has blessed us with her presence, with her. Uh, her, her gifts, her participation in Hope Church. And we do pray that you will uh, send her off with safe travels as she returns to uh, her seminary uh, education, that you'll give her wisdom and understanding of all things that uh, are discussed, and that you'll make it clear to her what her plan, uh, what your plan is for her uh, going forward. Because we know that uh, she loves you, we know that you love her, and, and have a great plan laid out for her. So I just want to conclude uh, with this, uh, these words from 2 Thessalonians. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you. That our God may make you worthy of his calling. And that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray that in the name of our Lord Jesus, uh, he may be glorified in you and that you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, Amen. I was supposed to bless you. <laughs> My job to do the benediction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I really, it, it was planned that I was going to thank you guys, so thank you. Uh, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your family for this summer. You have become like family to me. And it has been a rich blessing and a deep privilege to be here this summer, so thank you. I would like to bless you now and send you out with a benediction. Please receive this. Brothers and sisters, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit surround you and be within you, reminding you that he is a constant companion, delighting in you from within you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you always in your conversations and be the main focus of all that you do, reminding you of this precious gift. And may the love and the favor of God the Father be your foundation as you seek in whatever you do, word or deed, to do everything in his name and to proclaim this glorious mystery of God in us. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in peace.